Hello, protocols, packets, and programs. Tomorrow is Valentine's Day, created by the big compiler companies to sell more code. So whether you declare your love as constant or variable, I hope you find your type. And regardless of what language you choose, keep them safe in your memory. Which means this week, we chat with Nick Selby from Trail of Bits about the common mistakes that mature companies make in the cloud and if that wasn't enough of a security topic already, what safe AI needs. In the news segment, Reddit's breach, OpenSSL Vulns taking over a supplier's network, the top 10 web hacking techniques of last year, the cryptography in tiny IoT for next year, and more. Compile a poem and stay tuned for Application Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. It's the show to learn the latest tools, techniques, and processes necessary to understand DevOps, application security, and cloud security. Your trusted source for the latest application security news. It's time for Application Security Weekly. Passbolt is a free and open source password manager that allows your team to store, organize, and share passwords securely. Passbolt is privacy first and highly versatile. It can be installed on-prem behind your firewall, used in a secure cloud, or deployed as a cloud-native application. You can check out the source code on GitHub, extend it with the REST API, integrate it with the CLI or SDKs, and even contribute. Get started with Passbolt for free now. Check it out at securityweekly.com slash Passbolt. This is episode 229, recorded February 13th, 2023. I'm your host, Mike Shima. I'm here with John Kinsella. Hello, John. Mike, I haven't even gotten my Super Bowl commercial jokes out yet. You're already moving on to the Valentine's Day? Come on now. Hey, we got to start. We're also going to do an acapella re rendering of Diamonds later. So <laughs> um, hopefully you're paying attention to halftime. Because I'm also here with Akira. Hello, Akira. Hi, Mike. I'm very happy to report that I have indeed found my type, so it's a good Valentine's Day for me. <laughs> <laughs> this is good. And um, as I said, we'll be doing the Rihanna uh, cover at the end of the show. Uh, but in that case, if you have other suggestions or topics that you want us to cover, dear listeners, submit them to securityweekly.com slash guests. We review them monthly, and we'll reach out to you once reviewed. An accomplished information and physical security professional, Nick leads the software assurance division of Trail of Bits, giving customers in some of the world's most targeted industries a comprehensive understanding of their security landscape, technology, and infrastructure. Hello, Nick. Thank you for joining us. Hey, thanks a lot for having me. I'm sort of listening to the words from LinkedIn and really regretting a lot of them. <laughs> Well, I think um, uh, I think we might even be able to tie that later into as a callback later into our our, our discussion here. Let's see if we can do that because okay. the first thing we we wanted to get into was uh, some of the work you've done in in the cloud or have been doing in the cloud and what 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 mistakes people make. So trail of bits just to, uh, maybe to set you up a little bit for our listeners that very well known in consulting, very well known in going after classes of vulns. I think I, I I love that rather than just say we're going to give you the list of the individual bugs, go fix the bugs. That's not your approach. Your approach is fundamental problems in cryptocurrency and smart contracts and software and the cloud as well. And so we're, you're here to talk about the cloud. So why don't I stop talking and you maybe introduce a little bit of what you, um, some research that's coming out soon about your, your work in the cloud. Well, I really actually like the way you, the way you introduced us. That was, that was just great. And I, yeah, I think that all too often people will get an audit report back from us and they'll be like, okay, let's look at those bugs that you found and let's get after that. Actually, the most valuable thing that we give is, is called our, our, our code maturity index. And, and that is really where we take a look at, okay, we found these bugs. That's fine that we found them. Here's how to avoid making bugs like that in the future. And here's how to, to, up your maturity across 10 different categories uh, of software development, which is just, it's so much more useful, I think, than, than just here, fix this. Here, here's yes, a list absolutely. of things. Um, Alex Useche, who's our uh, engineering director for our cloud native practice within our application security team, uh, he's, been, he's been spending a lot of time uh, doing cloud native threat modeling and cloud native uh, application audits for some of the you know, household names, uh, some of the most mature companies in the business. And what we, the reason that we were going and taking a retrospective look back on the, the past year is, you know, from uh, from my time in the analyst world, I remembered everybody wants to make predictions about what's coming down the road. 
And, and we realized that, in fact, we've got some evidence because our, our customer base tends to be, as I say, they're very mature, uh, which means that they're kind of at the leading edge of, of cloud adoption. They're very mature mm-hmm. in terms of their, their real adoption of agility as a cultural uh, matter. You know, they're not just like, hey, I'm in the cloud, where's my agility? They're, they're really, they, they take it uh, very, very seriously. They, they've done a lot of work on their software development lifecycle, on their CI, CD, and they are, they're especially good at setting forth simple code, well-documented code, code that declares exactly what it is that it is trying to do in each section and gives advice about the security guarantees that that it, it wishes to establish. And so it's really easy to follow, even though it, it can be very complex. And they also have incredibly strong testing regimes and testing regimens so that they move beyond you know, unit testing and sort of static vulnerability analysis, but into more specialized static analysis, into, in, into dynamic analysis and fuzzing their applications. And then a very strong culture of testing, whether it's you know, somebody, somebody who's doing formal verification or whether they're doing uh, code audit the way, the way Trail of Bits does, that this is built in. And, so, and the whole point is to, to build just like we have layers of security we also have layers of testing, layers of discipline and culture to catch problems before they get to staging, let alone into production. Now, if, I, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I worried though well, that I, I, I interrupted you as possibly you were building up no, to no. this because you're giving us a great setup for this is what mature companies look like. And I love the focus, as you said, code comments, actually explainable code, understandable yeah. code. But I'm going to guess that you still find some problems. So regardless of this maturity, <laughs> <laughs> we, of course we do. And and you know, developers are human, and everybody wants to take shortcuts, and everybody wants to get to the cool stuff, and nobody likes nobody likes the boring stuff. And frankly, making new exciting features in new exciting technologies is really fun. And documenting it, and uh, paying down technical debt, and all the other things that those things are not fun. And so people try to maximize the first and minimize the second. Of, of course, we see that. I guess the 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 real difference is. Is that we know that if we're seeing our customers now making Mm -hmm. mistakes uh, commonly across all of them, then we know that in a year the sort of more more advanced companies that might not be as as mature as these guys they'll start making them over the next couple of years it's going to filter down into the entire environment because these are the things that if if they're this disciplined and this good at it and they're still making mistakes this is a mistake that has legs and so we can look at this as an evidence based prediction of what's coming down the road so. Uh, as I mentioned, Alex Vuceche is coming up with a blog post about this, and it's going to be really interesting, the top five uh, findings. So before I go on, let me just say what we're talking about. So cloud native, we're only talking about cloud native uh, services and applications okay. that are designed specifically to run in cloud infrastructure. Um Often it's like Kubernetes and uh, containerization, application mesh technology, stuff like that. And these are typically run as microservices uh, that are independently owned throughout the organization by different groups or making different micro- microservices. So that's, that's the scope of what we're talking about. Here's what I f- we find. <laughs> we find this universally uh, surprising. It's in the cloud, so it's secure, is still <laughs> there. <laughs> like, really? This is, oh. It is... Uh, amazing to me that this is something that you know everybody has been saying you shouldn't be thinking for at least ten years. I was I was joking in the pre-call like since we were having the argument of, about cloud adoption and opex versus capex, this has been an argument. Like you know, well, it's in the cloud, so it's insecure. It's in the cloud, so it's secure. That really is a pervasive thing that people still believe that. And and there's more dangerous dogma. Uh, the the I think among the most dangerous is it's Kubernetes, and so it defaults to secure right out of the tin. I think that that's a, a huge problem that still people have challenges believing. Um, and it's in a container, so our code is reproducible. Uh, it's sort of like, well, I can send you my, I can send you this containerized application and you can run it. Therefore, our code is great. Well, no, <laughs> it's really not a guarantee of anything. So, um, I do want to also mention before I tell you about these mistakes, cause some of them are funny. Um, pe- people want to develop cloud native applications and we think that it's very exciting because mm-hmm. you can do so many things. Uh, you, you can stretch the boundaries of what is possible. You can also do that while spending about 1% of what somebody would have had to spend about 20 years ago to build a similar application, a similar set of functionality. Um, the, on the downside, if you make a mistake in the cloud, you do it really quickly, and the consequences can be 
rather significant, rather fast. So you want to get this done right. Um, we look at our job as um, telling you where the risks are to enable you to take more risks, enable you to understand what the risks are, see how they affect you, see where the hazards are in your code base so that you can take advantage of these new technologies. That's that's what we look as our as our prime um uh, you know our prime purpose of of what we do. So uh, that's interesting because yeah, that 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 leads me to think that it's uh, from the perspective of this is security as an enabler for the business rather yes. than you're not describing. We look at your risks and tell you where more risks are, so you add more controls, become less risky, add less features, fewer features, do do fewer things, and, and so on. So I, I love this approach. I wanted to pull apart a little bit of the idea of like, okay, Kubernetes isn't secure out of the box. Um, <laughs> that seems, uh, unfortunately, too much software just isn't secure out of the box, yeah. it, it feels. And, and, and what maybe frustrates me, I'm not sure what, what, what word to use there, is that surprises me, perhaps, is that that's also the case for mature companies as well, as you were describing. I'm yeah. curious, was there an aspect of this list, or was you're looking at companies that also surprised you, that you just didn't expect to see, or not see, for that matter, from, from their practices? I guess the thing that really surprises me is that no matter how good you are, you're still making mistakes that are kind of just classic chestnuts from the information security space, you know, (laughs) segregate things and (laughs) encrypt things and and just really, really looking at at far less sexy, uh, far less exotic kinds of uh, vulnerabilities and, and mistakes that you can make and into some really pedestrian things that have always been the case. And and so it's, you know, just because it's cloud native doesn't mean that you're uh, smarter. Uh, we were talking also about like memory safe languages because you're using a memory safe language doesn't make your code safe. It just makes it harder to make mistakes. Um, but, you know, it, the mistakes are still possible. I, I think that the biggest surprise that I had was that um, we did not see in in our big in our in our look none of the top 5 was hard coding credentials into the code base nice now That's- i've seen that in a lot of places that are less mature than uh, than our customers uh, i've seen that in incident responses i've seen that in in consulting you know and just looking at different code bases but uh it did surprise me because it's so common that people actually hard code credentials or hard code secrets into their code I would have expected that still, but um, I, I will say that the 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 top two because I can't go into all five right now, but the top two, the the first one won't surprise anybody really. It's it's insufficient or missing access controls, um, putting too much of your trust in Kubernetes or in uh, EKS AKS. Like the, the you know, well, it's I'm using the Azure Kubernetes service, therefore it's fine. No, it, it really isn't, and. Um, we're, we're still looking at apps that are enforcing authentication controls at the perimeters, but they're still failing to apply principles of zero trust throughout, throughout the, the cloud infrastructure. And that's still a big problem, even if you are uh, a mature company. It's a, kind of, we, we sort of default to it because it's easier while you're doing that's, that. I think that that falls into the category of boring stuff that, that people don't want to deal with. They just want to get on and make the cool app. We've got um, a story coming up in the news. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and not directly related to what you're just saying. Well, sort of related. Um, the cloud providers, the amount of API endpoints they have, or not endpoints, but the amount of APIs they have is just like skyrocketing as yeah. they add more and more functionality. It, You know, if I think about setting permissions for a role in Kubernetes, my eyes start rolling back in my head. Yeah. Do you think, is it partially that same thing? It's just it's so complex that like, um, I mean, there, it gives you a ton of power and flexibility, but on the other side... You got to control the beast. Yes, and I think that I, I, you know there there are certain I think um, expectations that people have in less mature companies about the the kind of secure by default claims. Um, and there, there's a couple of things to say there. The first one is that like secure to AWS or Azure is not the same as secure to your application. You know their yeah. their security is that their pipes are moving and stuff is moving back and forth in the pipes the way it's supposed to. That could mean that you're getting hacked seven ways from Sunday and everybody's stealing all your customers' data and all of your money. 
but AWS would be like, hey, look, packets are moving. That's great. <laughs> you know, it's and and we, we know where it's coming from and where it's going. So that that's secure. So I think that separating what my security means as a as a developer versus their security, because AWS is not watching out for your app's security. They're watching out for the infrastructure security, which means that the infrastructure works as advertised. So that's I think a, a big thing. Um, uh, and I think a lot of times uh, that complexity that you mentioned with Kubernetes or really anything in the cloud, um, I, I think if you take a look at any any breach you've heard of in the past five years in the cloud was a misconfiguration of something foundational, which led to a either a lateral movement or a direct pop. That tells you that configuration is really tough, but it also tells you that people aren't using the tools that are available to test your configuration on a regular basis. Uh. It's really important, and you can do that. And there's there are free and open source tools. There are paid for tools, and and they're they're all pretty good at highlighting these things. This should not be as hot a startup space as it is, but it is because people are just not paying attention. They just want somebody to fix it for them. That's surprising because what I, when you were descri- when you were describing your surprise against uh, not seeing hard coded credentials, my mind did go to. A conjecture. Not sure I can support this necessarily, but you know, secrets management is a yeah. native part of AWS GCP, so it's it's just easier to do and use those tools. I would have thought that you know, even Amazon is moving to the space of here. We're mm-hmm. going to tell you about some of your misconfigurations. Yeah, but um, apparently, even as, as you said, even with the hot startup space, people just aren't. Is it not easy enough? That's to to adopt this. It's. There, it's too much complexity. What would you start to conjecture there? Or point to is maybe still so problems that we should be solving. I don't really, I don't really have evidence. I've got observations and anecdotes, but you know, then this is infosec. All we need um, are yeah. anecdotes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I honestly think that that a lot of it comes down to um, variance in uh, well, metaphor mapping and variance in expectations based on your role and responsibility. So your CTO and your CFO might be thrilled that you're moving into GCP. Um, your seat, you know, your your head of engineering or your head of development might think that he'd rather be in Azure or or AWS. But you know, okay, I'll take a look at what I've got here, and then by the time it filters down into into sprint goals and and you know what we're going to actually build, I think that a lot of people make assumptions that are based on incomplete communication and incomplete understandings of the infrastructure in which they are attempting to operate. And I think, and, and a lot of times it comes down to. If security does not have a seat at the table from the ideation stage, then very few, if any, people are going to raise their hand and point these things out. That the assumption, I mean, if I if I bet you all a six pack of Dr. Pepper right now that Kubernetes today will support TLS by default for interpod communication, I think that that would be a pretty safe bet to say, yeah, of course they do, and of course they don't, and that's shocking. To everybody, wait a minute, they don't, and like, and everybody just kind of thinks that they do, and you need another thing, right? And and unless you want to get into Istio wrangling, you're really not going to notice that. And the only person who's going to suggest it is either going to be a security guy or a, a compliance guy who wants logging and you know <laughs> some kind of proof that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah, yeah, no, I got. It's going to take me more than six bottles of Dr. Pepper to read through a 30-page Harding <laughs> guide for Kubernetes as it is right there. Um, and, but that's, that's a rant for another day. Yes. So <laughs> let's, let, let's also expand from, so uh, insufficient missing access controls, you know, Kubernetes yep. isn't necessarily hardened out of the gate. What about, um, so the software stack? The, we, we do live in the world of S-bombs. Are these yep. mature companies with S-bombs? Because I think you mentioned reproducible builds too, which is actually non-trivial to get to. Yeah. So, um, does this is, are, are these companies also benefiting from that as well? Or are they you know yes and no on that angle? Uh, yes and no. They're they're going towards it and and uh, salsa. The what is it? Software levels for secure security levels for software artifacts like SLSA uh, dot dev. Really awesome way to test where you are and and where where you should be. Uh, again, it's a, one of those free standards. I think it came from yep. the folks at Google, yep. uh, which is a, this is how they do it, and it's it's really quite instructive. Um, the The second most common issue that we had was insecure or outdated dependencies. I mean, how is it possible? <laughs> um, well, I uh, again, I, I don't have much evidence on why it's possible. I can just say anecdotally, people don't seem to think of... <laughs> Ken Thompson said in, in this 1984 paper, Reflections on Trusting Trust, that you should 
you can't trust code that you didn't totally create yourself. And everybody's like, oh yeah, that's true. And then they create their code and they have this forest of vulnerabilities and they're only looking at the code that they created and they're not thinking of the the, the vulnerabilities. This is a, a, it's a surprisingly common conversation with a lot of companies that we talk to where they don't, either they, they've underestimated the importance or they've underestimated the difficulty of determining um software supply chain and i and i uh i think it's also really interesting like everybody's got a lot of moving excuse me everybody's got a lot of moving parts in their in their cloud native software and there's there's front end uis there's apis there's lambda functions there's all this stuff that's going on and 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 moving data and that all of that code all of this modern code has lists of dependencies and all of those dependencies themselves have nested dependencies all the way down to bare metal. And this is something that often isn't looked at or the way machines will uh, satisfy dependencies uh, is different. And so you end up with, you know, two machines which are, quote, the same, like, you know, I'm sure your staging and your production environment are exactly the same. Um, but but when you actually take a look at how these these servers have, have resolved these dependencies, they could be radically different. Nobody's actually looking at that. They sort of run an S-bomb and they say, that's what we've got. That is not what you've got. It's it, it is actually probably scratching the surface. We released uh, a free and open source tool last year called uh, It Depends, which helps people do recursive um, re- recursive dependency uh, mapping, and so that you can actually see how this works on a per machine basis. But this is an area where I think people need a lot of help because it's it is really non trivial. It sounds like it's trivial, and and I love what Alan Friedman talks about with uh, you know the ingredients list. But it isn't as simple as an ingredients list. Uh, it's it's more like a bomb in a factory of how to make the ingredients, which is you know complicated. Um, I think that uh, if we also th- just think about the fact that developers often will only focus on their code again because that's the fun place to be. The list of things that are outside their direct control or even indirect control just grows every single day. And and I think that there, people have to recognize that. Yeah, I'm curious too, especially as you're looking at the. the I, I'm going to make a note here. We do, we should talk about the other end of the spectrum. What how how do companies that aren't necessarily mature approach this? Handle this? Yeah. But before we get there, I do have one quick question here on the the S bombs aspect. Now I am still a, a fan of them of the principles behind yeah. it. Yeah. But I'm curious too, as you look at these companies, and they see, you know, uh, you know, one thing that S bombs don't necessarily show is configuration issues. So yeah. th- that's good. Um, another thing, though, is just do I start fixing all my dependency issue, every known vulnerability? Do I keep everything up to date on the very latest software package? I like the idea of doing that, but I'm curious if that actually translates into the real world with real engineers, with real products, and you know, not real delivery really. time roadmaps. You know? <laughs> Not really, and not every day. And so it's really important to, yes. to, to get control <laughs> over that. Um, just upla- uh, updating to the latest and greatest does not necessarily give you uh, the confidence. Look, you're, you're probably going to be a little bit better off. But I, I would say that if you're already going to that extent, then you should probably go a little bit farther and do it right. And then you won't be wasting any energy or duplicating effort when you find out that the thing you just installed last week needs to be installed now because the thing that was that was not covered in the last update but will be covered in the next one, blah, blah, blah. So I, I think that that's important. I, look, I, I I think that the way less mature companies can uh, can understand or or can can improve is by you know a problem well defined is a problem half solved. Like just really start the the process that so many people are talking about of of generating s bombs and taking a look at what you have. Enumeration is really step one. What do I have in my environment that I can tell right now? I can get better later. I can I can get much more granular later. But but even that first hit at a list is a it's a big step forward. And and so getting a sense of how big the problem is 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 the first step to solving it. Well, maybe that's a great setup of saying you know how big is this problem? Let's talk about those. Organizations, those companies that aren't necessarily on that high mature end, they don't have millions, plural, or you know, multi millions budget of either security teams, let alone, you know, or sure. engineers. How do they start to, you know, you've got five problems it, for, for them to look at as they're going into the cloud. 
how do they start approaching this? Um, I, I think you actually start at, at what it is that you're trying to do and start to describe what your software is supposed to be doing, what your application should be doing, and the expected behaviors and the required behaviors, and start looking at it uh, from that, the, you know, the, the standpoint of invariance or the standpoint of like what I, I like to call the Soviet model, like that which is not required is forbidden. And, and, and if you start to, if you can start to break down your code and find any place where it's difficult to follow your intent, any place where it's difficult to understand what it is that you're supposed to be doing here, what your, what your goal is, is to have a really good, solid sense of what you are saying the security of your system is, what you are counting on, and what you are counting on something else to do for you. And really separating those things out, I think, is the, is probably the first step if you, if you've done nothing. Um, I think a lot of times people will, they'll do something like they'll run, you know, a, a great scanner like SNCC or something like that. And they'll be like, oh, okay, well, I've scanned it. I'm fine. And the answer is no, you've begun and you should use some of the things that you learn from that to, to, um, to be able to, to empower you to look for more things, but you shouldn't look at any, any test as, okay, I'm done. Everything you do should be a, a you know, a point in time snapshot uh, and, and you should get as close to continually understanding the health of your code as often as you can. So the, I'm wanted. To, I mentioned in, in the intro uh, about AI too. I mean, mm-hmm. there, there's a bit of a, a hard turn we're going to make, and I'm trying to connect the, to the two topics. One is I will just say we we've been talking about cloud, been talking about the approaches to cloud, and you were talking about I think secure coding in so many words of simplified code that has documentation, code mm-hmm. comments, declaring environments, etc. Talking about testing, maybe we've got um last part of this interview. I'd like to talk about AI and ML because that's an area that you and Trail of Bits have been looking at as well. In, including the security of it. Now, I don't think mm-hmm. you have a top five list of mistakes no, yet. We could ask we Chat B- GPT to uh, give us them in the style of Nick Selby and Trail of Bits, perhaps. But um, maybe <laughs> set us up. What are you actually looking at? Because if you notice, I'm struggling to even try to um, pull in some terminology here. We don't have that's like awesome. the, the AWS, the Azure But that's, a, that's a great yes. place to start, right? And, and Dr. Heidi Klaff, who is our, um, she's our engineering director for, for machine learning and AI. And um, she's got her doctorates in formal verification she comes to us from the safety industry like she worked on nuclear power plants to make sure that those are safe. And, and boy, you know, coming from the infosec world to talk to somebody who's actually saying, okay, we don't want to blow things up and kill people. It's like, it's a really, <laughs> it's a very grounded conversation. It's really great. And um, when, when, we, uh, when we hired her, it was with the understanding that ML, AI, they are at the absolute pinnacle of Mount Hype right now. They are the hottest things in the world. No one wants to hear unless they bring up the dreaded term Skynet. Nobody wants to talk about security in ML or AI. They're just like, hey, look how cool this is. Let me turn it on. And what what our argument really is, as we're as we're standing up, the, you know, we have this new practice of, of machine learning and AI, and we're doing security for it, and, and, and we're doing audits and engineering help for that. And some of the things that we're saying is, you know, th- a lot of this hasn't yet been invented. It is a greenfield. M- machine learning security has been a greenfield. AI security is really a greenfield. The current tech stack in uh, ML is is really kind of, <laughs> it, it, there's a culture of open source adoption by the people who are working on ML systems that they want to just grab as much free and open source software as they can. The problem is that a lot of the tools that they're grabbing and using, they were created as academic or independent tools. These were not made as critical high assurance applications and you know th- and we're trusting them with high assurance needs and when i say high assurance we mean like there are catastrophic consequences when things go wrong and people are like oh yeah let me just grab this random thing off the internet and run it let me grab this pickle file let me grab this whatever they're grabbing and starting so uh, they're they're not recognizing that these tools that they're using are often riddled with security problems, and they if they if they think about it, they're saying, "Hey, our model will compensate for it." No, it won't. That's like a guitar that's tuned at the factory. It's it, it, you can't like expect that it's just going to be guaranteed forever. Indeed, and you it's mentioned like, too. So, oh, go ahead, John. Just real quick, it it sort of reminds me of supply chain issues, but on a completely yeah. different level. It it really Good is, luck with and the I think it, because the ground is shifting underneath our feet, just like with mm-hmm. just like with S bomb. 
And I was going to say, too, you mentioned, you know, the Ken Thompson's paper from 1984, his lecture yeah. on Reflections on Trusting Trust, and to tie into John's comment about S-bombs, you know, the yes, these models are created in, in academic space, being tested, but there's a lot of emergent research on adversarial models. How yeah. do I attack the model? How do I introduce, or even how would you even be able to detect a, a, a intentional backdoor, a, an untrustworthy model, when you already have difficulties in explainability of, of ML, oh, that decision so, space? Well, yeah, and that brings us into sort of the, the second and third problem. Um, the, the short answer is... <laughs> It's it's difficult at this point because I think that the, the second problem is in response to the first one, um, people are saying let's just use the existing tools that we have out there to to determine security and and to assure security. The existing tools that are out there aren't aren't actually made for that. Like so, there there are some concepts that are the same, but the techniques and approaches need to be need to be updated. And like we we have released free and open source tools to do exactly what you're talking about. We have a tool called Privacy Raven, which which is an attack simulator um, against deep learning systems because people were not actually understanding how the like how their models could be attacked and what could be extracted from uh, from those models even when it's anonymized even when they think that it's safe let's really test it and that hasn't been done um, the, the the last thing is as we audit and try to come to that like how do we audit you there is a real lack of uh, standards in the industry on how to, uh, what are we auditing against? What does safety actually mean in ML and AI? What does security mean in ML and AI? And surprisingly, the answer really varies. And a lot of times people are talking about this stuff called value alignment, which is really different. Um, and what they're saying is basically, we have to make sure that this application, this thing does exactly what we want it to do, which sounds great until you think about what people want things to do. And then it becomes a real problem. That That is about, you know, as sexy as the Skynet conversation can ever get. <laughs> and and it's not a good conversation. Any Anybody who's, who's expert in the fields of machine learning or AI just kind of giggles when you say Skynet. Um, the problems, I think, are much more fundamental than that. And yeah, the, the, so that, the that's what our discussion. team is working on. Yeah, that, that ethics discussion has to find a better terminology and a richer, something richer than at the one end, as you mentioned, Skynet. Oh, excellent movie, by the way. But also the <laughs> other end of that is just silly trolley problems and, and, the, yeah. and the what-if scenarios. And um, neither of them, I think, are right now particularly informative for the discussion around uh, AI and, and safety. I'm curious, you, you mentioned too, like, getting to standards and something as simple for example um, we we covered the 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 threat model the the audit that um, yeah of that was done against curl so mm -hmm. and, and that had some very obvious things here's talking about some some c based issues here is you know some threat models what can we start to expect or what should we be expecting to look into to how to inform these particular types of discussions for AI specific topics? I'm, I'm really glad you said that. And Alex, uh, who wrote the the top five cloud native and, and uh, Heidi, Alex was very uh, instrumental in the, in the curl audit. And he and Heidi have been working quite a bit on exactly that because the, the threat models need to be adjusted just a little bit to understand. I think that a, a lot of times the, the issue when I was talking about the tech stack that people are using for ML or AI, it, there's an assumption that, okay, well, if I built a website and it works this way, then I should build an ML application that should work that way. And suddenly you've got a bunch of, you know, stuff running in Kubernetes on AWS that's ML and it's, it's supposed to make decisions that are like really scary to make. And, and so when we think about the threat model, we have to ask a lot of foundational questions that, that we haven't had to ask before, starting with what is this thing supposed to do and what are we counting on it? What are the guarantees of security that it's supposed to be delivering? How can we tell? That that it isn't doing that. This you mentioned uh, ChatGPT, the, like the the hallucination problem is a really bad problem to have if it's a mission critical, time sensitive thing. And so so how can we make threat models that can actually function in a in a world with a new lexicon, a new a new way of describing new threats that just simply haven't existed before? So that is the work of of our ML and AI team. Uh, as they as they work uh, with all of our other practices, and also as they stand up their sort of vertical, we will we will audit your ML code kind of practice. Uh, the, these are the problems that we're wrestling with. Yeah, and I think too the part, maybe to to kind of tie this together, we haven't yet seen the. Uh, it, 
the inception of, of AI. In other words, using AI to do code reviews on on the code. Uh, you know that self introspection. And I yes. think you know even Chat GPT says don't try to use this. Um, yes, <laughs> but people still want to, right? They still want to play with toys. See what see what can be done. Yeah, they do. And I, I mean, I, I would really strongly recommend against it right now. Um, I, I don't think that the technology is ready for it. I think that, uh, like you've seen in, you know, write a note to my mother giving her a good excuse of why I didn't come to the family dinner on Thursday. If they're screwing that up, I don't want to ask them, hey, is this really scary aviation system that I want to launch? Is that safe or am I good to go? You know, it's, it's really kind of, we need to get there and build up. The only way that we're really going to get to that place, which would be a great place to be, is if we take the security and safety of these systems seriously now. And I think that what I'm watching is something that's a little bit alarming because it feels like early days of the internet. Like, wow, it's a computer. Others can talk to it. And I let's go. And no one's actually thinking or they're, they're sort of acting as if a lot of the problems that are brand new have already been solved and they haven't. Some of those problems to tie, just to tie back to the cloud or like TLS between nodes, just you know encryption. Now I think that's a little bit mixed metaphor for talking about AI, but there's still a privacy angle there and the confidentiality about model extraction and what was the what was the data this was trained on and yes. can I find the one per, one specific thing that is you know privacy for for me as opposed to me as an aggregated part of that group. Well, it's funny because, like, think about the conversation here. Like, uh, we started out talking about the fact that engineers, even after three years of people screaming about S bomb and dependencies, I'm telling you that the number two finding is is that even in the most mature cloud native application development companies, they're still having challenges understanding their dependency libraries, and they're they're they're, they're not actually going through that. These are the same people we would count on to make the ML stuff mm. safe and secure. It doesn't really add up. I mean, the, there there are humans involved in this, and so we we do need uh, processes that can support safe and secure development of these really important, really exciting apps in such a way that they don't do harm. So as we come to come to the end here, since since I'm still fortunate to be able to talk to humans in the world of podcasting and not doing harm, there's of course uh, you know the laws of robotics we could talk about, but I like to just simplify it down, Nick, to describing AppSec in three words. How would how would if if I throw that to you, how would you describe it? Yeah, I'm I, I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of. I, I think the easiest way is guaranteeing application security. Guarantee. All right. Well, said you that. I know I have to do the counting. Okay, that that was three. That counts. But um, so now when when people have um, so if anybody has some some questions about their guarantee, we can provide your contact information later. But if they have questions about other things you've been working on, especially the 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 the, the top five uh, issues you've been finding in, in cloud or this work on AI, uh, what what would you like to draw their attention to? So there's uh, on Twitter we are at Trail of Bits. Dan Guido is uh, at D Guido. And uh, our website is trailofbits.com. We have a, a blog that's that's really quite good. Um, we also have a podcast, which is trailofbits.audio, and we're just about to uh, start production for season two, which should be out in April. We'd love to have people come and check it out. Awesome. Thank you again, Nick. This was a fun conversation. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Also, I want to thank Akira, John, thank all of our listeners. We're going to take a quick break and return with news of the week. <laughs> 